welcome everyone to the first member speaker series of 2021. We're delighted to have so many of you joining us today. It looks like we're, we're nearing, oh, 150 folks. So it's great to see so many of you joining us, although I can't really see you. <laughs> Uh, before we begin our adventure to the North Shore, I wanted to let you know about next month's special speaker series that I hope many of you have probably already seen in your e-newsletter. In honor of Black History Month, we'll welcome Abra Lee to our virtual stage for a program entitled Lift Every Voice. Abra is a horticulturalist, historian, and Longwood Gardens Fellow who will tell us some of the untold stories of the country's African-American gardeners and horticulturalists. This program is scheduled to take place on Tuesday, February 16th, at the same start time of 11 a.m. Registration is available online and through the membership office. This program will continue virtually for the foreseeable future, so just keep watching. Um, the next issue of the bulletin will come out late next month and have a whole, uh, a whole series of programs. We're scheduled through about June or July at this point, but we look forward to bringing you this series every month and staying connected in this way. Now it's my pleasure to introduce Ben Lenhart, a board member of the Garden Conservancy for more than 15 years, Ben served as its chair from 2011 to 2018. An avid gardener and preservationist in both Charleston, South Carolina and Winnetka, Illinois, Ben serves on the boards of Drayton Hall, the Gibbs Museum of Art, the Preservation Society of Charleston and the Chicago Botanic Garden. He's a contributor to Garden Design Masterclass, which was published by Rizzoli in 2020. His recent book, The Gardens of the North Shore of Chicago, was published last fall and is, of course, the topic of today's presentation. If you're interested in purchasing a copy of the book, a link to save 30% was provided in your email reminder and is also available through the membership office. Thank you to Ben and to Monticelli Press for that generous discount. For the program today, we will be taking questions at the end as much as time allows using the Zoom's Q&A feature. So feel free to type those questions as, as the program goes on or at the end. Thank you again for being with us today and let me turn it over to Ben. Well, thank you and Allison for inviting me to speak uh, to members and friends of the Missouri Botanical Garden today. I'm also very pleased that so many garden enthusiasts have joined and who would like to learn about some exceptional gardens on the North Shore of Chicago. I'm gonna spend the next 30 minutes or so talking to you about 25 special private gardens and some highlights of the Chicago Botanic Garden. Afterwards, uh, as Kate said, I look forward to answering any questions that you may have. But first, I want to answer some questions that I have been asked since the book was released on October 20th. Why did I write this book? Three factors influenced me for writing. First, as you know, there are many wonderful books about gardens on the East Coast, in the Southeast, such as Charleston, where I am speaking to you from, the Northwest, and California. However, the Midwest seems to have been overlooked. In fact, no book about gardens on the North Shore of Chicago has been published in over a hundred years. I wanted to let the world know about some exceptional gardens on the North Shore and the people who created them. In addition, there are many different styles and sizes of gardens on the North Shore and I wanted to share their beauty and the talents of those who created them. And thirdly, and equally important, I wanted to document these exceptional gardens for future generations. As Russell Page, the legendary landscape designer said, there are few gardens that can be left alone. A few years of neglect and only the skeleton of a garden can be traced. In most cases, documenting gardens is the best way gardens can be preserved for the future. As some of you know, one of the programs of the Garden Conservancy is documenting outstanding American gardens. I am pleased to say that all of the final photographs taken by Scott Shigley, my photographer, will be given to the Garden Conservancy for their permanent documentation collection. When starting this project, I knew that it would be best if I could work with a local landscape photographer. 
This would allow us to photograph gardens at their prime and also deal with the vagaries of the weather. I spoke with Doug Hare and Craig Bergman, both prominent landscape architects in Chicago, who highly recommended Scott Shigley, who did photography for them. Scott is a very talented photographer and most importantly, easy to work with and has become my friend. People also ask, how did you decide which gardens to include? There are many beautiful gardens on the North Shore. The common theme running through these gardens is the interest the owners have in their creations. Some are dirt gardeners, like me, while others are less so, but all share a passion and love for their paradises. The gardens reflect a sensitivity of place and respect for the architecture of the house. Some gardens have showy, colorful beds, while others are light and dreamy. Some are highly structured, formal, and perfectly balanced, while others have evolved over time without a specific plan. No matter what the style, the plantings, or the size, all share excellence in design and horticulture. As Barb Carr, the former president of the Chicago Botanic Garden, concludes in her foreword, Ben once told me, great gardens have souls. Gardens of the North Shore of Chicago is a collection of exceptional gardens that Ben has ensured are gardens with souls, all reflecting the visions of the people who dreamed of them and the people who made them. Now let's look at a few photos of these gardens with souls. As I mentioned earlier, I wanted to show the diversity of gardens on the North Shore. So I have included 25 private gardens. I grouped the gardens in the book into four categories based on the predominant style of the garden. We begin with classic gardens. This photo shows one of the vibrant mixed borders in the pergola garden at Camp Rosemary as you walk towards the walled garden. Let's turn to Karen and King Harris's garden in Winnetka. Charles Stick of Charlottesville, Virginia developed a series of garden rooms separated by yew hedges with boxwood hedges demarcating pathways and borders. This photo which was taken from the second floor of the house, shows a path leading from the dining terrace to the perennial garden with peacock topiaries in the distance. The rose garden enclosed by yew hedges consists of boxwood edged beds containing David Austin shrub roses in Karen's favorite shades of pink, coral, and white. Garden Hybrid is my name for this classic garden in Glencoe. When the owners purchased their Georgian Revival house over 20 years ago, they asked landscape architect Scott Byron to help create a combination of the formality of a French garden with the color and the looseness of an English garden. Windows and terraces offer views of two matching boxwood parterres on either side of this intervening grass carpet, which is bordered by perennial beds in shades of lavender, blue, pink, and white. On a foggy day, Scott Shigley photographed this graceful ancient hawthorn tree that is artistically braced for support. The garden owners are collectors of contemporary art. On the upper pool terrace, Jean-Michel Orthonel's mirrored glass sculpture contrast with the lilac standards and the tightly clipped boxwood. Beauty Without Boundaries is the garden of Shirley and Pat Ryan in Winnetka and was designed by Deborah Nevins. As a young girl, Shirley developed a love of tulips because each May her parents took the family on a pilgrimage to Holland, Michigan for the annual Tulip Festival. In the Tulip Garden, an allee of mature honey locust trees presides over large drifts of tulips 
in varying sizes, shapes, and colors. Terracotta pots line the alley with peony-shaped angelique tulips. The cloister garden features climbing wisteria on the Tudor-styled pergola and boxwood parterres with topiary peacocks sculpted from yews. Deborah Nevins designed this creative boxwood amphitheater with four white crabapple trees on the ridge. This verdant delight can be seen from both the terrace as well as from the interior swimming pool. Maureen and Scott Byron's garden was naturally designed by Scott, a landscape architect. Maureen wanted a large screen porch for family dining and entertaining. There are many wonderful views from this porch, including this bluestone terrace with a contemporary fountain. A pleached Armstrong maple alley nestled into boxwood frames provides the focal point as one enters the porch. Clonola is an historic garden in Lake Forest that has been lovingly restored and enhanced by Stephanie and John Harris. Landscape architect Charles Stick, whom I mentioned earlier, design and who designed John's parents' garden, worked closely with the Harrises to fulfill Stephanie's motto, doing right by the house and landscape. Ferruccio Vitali, in 1927, designed the formal garden seen here after renovation by Stick. The garden is bounded by arts and crafts lattice paneling surrounding the descending lawn and perennial borders and terminates with the small pool and replica of Diana de Versailles. An intricate boxwood parterre provides greenery on the large rear bluestone terrace, which opens onto a greensward and prairie beyond. Mixed borders alongside the walled garden to the right offer seasonal color. The vegetable garden, as Stephanie calls it, is actually two large garden rooms, a cutting garden and a vegetable garden that is surrounded by hornbeam hedges with white Chippendale gate openings. The larger cutting garden room, pictured here, has four large boxwood parterres with old apple trees, perennials, and white iceberg roses surrounding a wellhead. Edgecliff is another historic property and the home of Donna and Terry McKay in Winnetka. Lead containers filled with pale and deep pink geraniums, purple petunias, and coleus flank the entrance to the French manor house. Craig Bergman reimagined the landscape, which was originally designed by Catherine Brewster in the early 1930s. The walled garden displays a limestone edged fountain and lawn panel that is surrounded by exuberant mixed borders and overflowing antique urns. The pergola, inspired by the Great Dixter Garden in England, overlooks the pool terrace with its double border of perennials. As Donna says, when the gen grandchildren visit, they almost swim among the flowers. Now we turn to Peggy Crow's garden in Lake Forest. This portion of the garden was designed by Rosemary Vary, whom Peggy and her late husband, Jack, met while attending the Chelsea Flower Show some years ago. Rosemary took up the assignment and enlisted Craig Bergman to be her man on the ground regarding plantings and installation. Here is the quadrant garden room exploding with perennials in July. The plane tree alley which was designed by Jack, is punctuated with terracotta pots filled with boxwood globes and terminates with a sculpture by John Kearney. Halcyon Lodge, a name given to the property by the original owners in 1905, 
is located in Lake Forest. The parterre garden was part of the original design, but the garden owner reduced the size of each quadrant to provide for larger pathways. The formal garden seen here burst forth each spring with tulips and other bulbs and later with perennials and annuals in the summer. As you may recognize, the cover of the book is this same parterre garden, but in summer bloom. This is a photo of one of two matching borders in the courtyard garden. Elegance is created with white perennials and annuals, along with mock orange shrubs and large lead urns perched in lattice-backed alcoves. Camp Rosemary in Lake Forest is the creation of the garden owner with the assistance of landscape architects and designers. The parterre garden is filled with a combination of blue and lavender perennials and annuals with white and lavender roses on the outer edges. The manicured striped bent grass lawn can be seen in the background. The pergola garden, the first garden created by the owner, consists of three mixed borders facing each other. This one has a rarely seen Bradford pear hedge as its backdrop and includes perennials and annuals, all in the garden owner's favorite colors of pink, fuchsia, lavender, and blue. The earlier photograph introducing classic gardens was the opposite mixed border in this perennial border, pergola border. The white garden is an intimate alcove surrounded by hydrangeas, bugbane, variegated dogwood, flowering dogwood, and perennials. A tall Chinese female figure stands at the end and also at the entrance. Now we're going to move to contemporary gardens. This is a view of alliums bursting in late spring in a bed in front of the contemporary house of the Blooms in Winnetka. Amy and Andy Bloom commissioned Doug Hare to create an artistic blend of naturalistic plantings in the front of the property with a contemporary design in the, in the rear near the lake. Here we see a portion of the curving entrance drive with Lake Michigan in the distance. Drifts of ladies mantle, alliums, and betony carpet the woodland. Terraces on three different levels offer options for dining, entertainment, and sports activities. Descending from an upper level to the pool is a wide grass slope with adjacent triangles and rectangles of Euonymus. The late John Bryan and Deville decided they wanted a guest house for their children and grandchildren, hence the summer house. The house is located near the original dairy barn complex in Lake Bluff. Peter Wirtz of Belgium created a contemporary landscape in keeping with the John Vinci designed two-story glass and stucco building with its viewing tower. Here we see three canals reflecting the viewing tower and the ever-changing sky. Tightly clipped asymmetrical hornbeam hedges, a trademark of Peter and his fa famous father Jacques, surround the east side of the house and provide dramatic linkage with the adjacent pastures. The Garden of Curves, my name for this garden located in Winnetka, was designed by landscape architect Doug Hare. The two-story stucco pavilion was designed by Larry Booth. Three giant rough cut stone slabs surrounded by rhododendron, rogersia, pachysandra, and ferns greet visitors. A path winds through the woodland with a carpet of ladies mantle and ornamental allium. Curved irregular herringbone 
stone walls contain the swale of lawn seen in the background. The next section of the book covers country gardens. This is a photo of an extensive mayapple grove at Crabtree Farm in early spring. When visiting Medawa Manor today, you would certainly not know that Donna La Pietra and Bill Curtis had little experience with gardening when they purchased Medawa Manor in 1990. Donna and Bill have restored and created many new gardens, including this aqua theater with its lawn platform for musical and theatrical performances, surrounded by water and an evergreen backdrop. Espaliered apple trees separate the vegetable garden from the meadow where blue camassia blooms in late spring. Bill, who grew up in Kansas, has always had a love affair with prairies. Here they have created a large mound reminiscent of an Indian mound with three different levels for viewing the 30 acre prairie of blazing star in full bloom in August. The back cover of the book is another photo of the prairie. Anne and Brian Belusic have been gardening together since they were first married. After moving to Winnetka, they engaged Craig Bergman to help create pocket gardens around the house. A hornbeam bower shelters the vintage statue at the entry to the motor court. Anne is a master at mixed plantings, placing peonies, roses, delphiniums, and poppies in beds as if they were flowers in a vase. Crabtree Farm, located in Lake Bluff, is an historic property and was purchased by the late John Bryan and Neville in 1984. In the Rose Garden, near the entrance to the house, pink and yellow hybrid tea roses fill boxwood-edged parterres, while climbing roses, clematis jacmani, and ferns hug the perimeter. The heart of the gardens at Crabtree Farm is Neville's cutting and vegetable garden. Bordered on one side by a line of pleached crabapple trees, boxwood edged beds contain colorful zinnias, snapdragons, and perennials blooming in late summer. John wanted his own garden, so he created a formal walled garden across from Neville's cutting and vegetable garden. The centerpiece is a large antique lead cistern overflowing with sedum, facing a lawn panel surrounded by perennials with hydrangeas climbing the walls. The gardens at 900 in Lake Forest combine the professional and the personal lives of Craig Bergman and Paul Klug in an historic architectural complex. The West Gardens feature double mixed borders planted with daylilies, bee balm, phlox, and other perennials with four large hornbeam cylinders in the distance. A snowfall of pink crabapple blossoms appears in spring. One of Craig's favorite spots is the shade garden, which features brightly colored coleus, chartreuse Japanese forest grass, a golden Japanese maple, and silvery blue brunera. You may say Fredonia, Wisconsin is not on the North Shore, and you would be right. So why did I include this garden? The answer is, I visited Joe Gromacki's garden several years ago, and I was blown away. I wanted to find a way to include it in the book. So I asked my editor, Elizabeth White, if I could cheat a little and say that Fredonia is just a little north of the North Shore. And she said, yes, we've done that before with other books. Joe, a passionate preservationist and collector, acquired the property two decades ago. 
he has created a rural farmstead featuring colonial style gardens filled with heirloom plants. Here is a view of 18th century style falling terraces separated by grassy slopes and paths. At Kelton House Farm, the highest fall, which is closest to the house, contains the rarest plants. Lower terraces are reserved for vegetables. A boxwood parterre, vegetables and sunflowers can be seen on the second fall with the garden house and a peafowl house elevated by eight English staddle stones in the background. Late summer brings bright perennial and annual colors surrounding some of Joe's extensive collection of antique garden ornaments. Old Mill Farm in Lake Forest is the home of Sherry and Frank Mariani. Over the years, Frank has created a number of gardens on the property. His first garden was the enclosed vegetable and cutting garden. Frank, an avid cook, says, I wanted my own vegetable garden so I could go out and pick whatever was needed for dinner that night. Espaliered fruit trees separate the orchard from the lawn and prairie beyond. Frank renovated the prairie where today more than 15 species of prairie grasses grow alongside flowering perennials, such as purple coneflowers, Culver's root, and New England asters. A seemingly endless vista towards the prairie extends out beyond lush perennial borders of a stilby, coneflowers, Culver's root, and queen of the prairie. Sarah and Jim Tenbrock live in Lake Forest on property that was once the first Crabtree farm of Grace Duran before she moved to Lake Bluff. Craig Bergman assisted the Tenbrooks with the design of the garden. Sarah says when they purchased their house, there were no crabapple trees present, even though the property was the site of the first Crabtree farm. So Sarah said, we need to have crabapple trees. Today, a cloud of white crabapple blossoms highlight the formal ivy-clad entrance in spring. The formal garden to the west of the house includes four quadrants of roses, delphiniums, foxgloves, lilies, catmint, and one of Sarah's favorites, peonies. My wife Cindy and I purchased our house in Winnetka in 1980. I have since then relied on trial and error for the creation of the garden. Many times it has been error, unfortunately. The Nantucket style architecture and its location at the top of a ravine guided all my gardening decisions. Stone steps descend through terrace borders, which are filled with perennials and annuals. The ravine garden is an inspiration from a visit Cindy and I made some years ago to Catravon, the incredible garden in Canada of Garden Conservancy founder, Frank Cabot. Today, giant Japanese butterbur, one of my favorite plants, mingles with Joe pie weed, irises, variegated, variegated sweet flag, and ferns. In early June, Siberian iris and giant Japanese butterbur emerge in the moist soil of the ravine adjoining the woodland garden to the upper right. The last section of the book is focused on naturalistic gardens. Here crabapple trees mark a meadow opening at Kathy and Don Levine's garden in Highland Park. Don, a devoted conservationist, 30 years ago enlisted Scott Byron to save and restore 14 acres of abandoned farmland in Northwest Highland Park. Today, there are over two and a half miles of sandy gravel paths that meander through indigenous trees, shrubs, and flowers. Wooded walkways suddenly open up to a prairie and sky. 
bordered by sweeping soft colored perennials and annuals. The pond is a refuge for birds and other wildlife. The late Marianne McLean created with the help of Craig Bergman, an amazing garden in Medawa. A diverse and significant Asian sculpture collection assembled by Mary McLean was the impetus for Marianne's garden. Bergman designed floating islands in a naturalistic setting amid a Midwest forest with strategically placed sculptures and other antiquities. Seen here, a zigzag gravel path leads to the elevated Ming Dynasty stone temple and columns in the background. Tang Dynasty horses wander in the brilliantly colored maple and oak forest in autumn. A walled garden known to neighborhood children as the secret garden is the paradise the late John Green and his wife Jean created for their family over 30 years ago. Doug Hare, recently, having recently returned to Chicago from an internship in England with the late John Brooks, was eager to demonstrate his skills on his first major residential commission. Shallow steps with ladies' mantle, lamb's ear, and other perennials growing out of the gravel treads descend from the terrace to the lawn and the pond. Throughout the garden, whimsical bronze sculptures of animals created by Jean, the sculptress and painter, give a sense of humor and surprise to the garden. Here, a lively frog known as the ballet dreamer lifts a foot in delight near the pond Jean says John posed for this sculpture. Nicole Williams and her husband, Larry Becker, have in Glencoe combined a Jin Jensen inspired meadow with a Japanesque landscape as Larry likes to call. The garden has a collection of over 50 cultivars of Japanese maples, rare shrubs and trees. Throughout the growing season, Larry prunes all of the maples as well as the conifers. Japanese painted ferns and Japanese maples of different colors and sizes line the path to the Shade Garden Tory Gateway. A canary yellowed flowered magnolia and the russet leaves of a Japanese maple are harbingers of early spring. A moon bridge and Japanese tea house are seen in the distance. Cone flowers, ornamental alliums, astilbes, hyssops, and bear's breeches create bold drifts of color in the upland meadow in full summer. The historic Rumsey Estate, designed by Jen Jensen in the early 20th century, is the home of Sandy and Roger Deramidi today. Surrounding the house, Claire and Ryan Kettlecamp created picturesque style gardens in keeping with the English style manor house. Giant blue lobelia blooms in the clearing of native grasses and prairie perennials that evokes the work of Jen Jensen. The Mayflower Ravine, which runs through the property, uh, was over, uh, has had suffered greatly with erosion, fallen trees, and collapsed tableland over the past century. Roger wanted to restore the ravine to the natural look of the Jensen era. The restoration became an astounding five year engineering project. Listen to this. More than 1 million pounds of topsoil was spread and native plantings of more than 275 trees, 3,400 shrubs and 39,000 perennials were installed. Today, the natural beauty of the ravine glows in autumn. The last garden in the book is the world-class Chicago Botanic Garden in Glencoe. This garden has been an inspiration for many of the garden owners and landscape architects and designers 
represented in the book. This is a photo taken last October of the, of, that's October of 2019, of the iconic Linden Alley, punctuated with stone spheres. John Brooks, the late English landscape designer mentioned earlier, created the Helen and Richard Thomas English walled garden. Each room of this garden represents a different tradition of England's long gardening history. Here we see the formal daisy garden. Evening Island, designed by Omi von Sweden and Associates, is five acres of layered masses of foliage and flowering plants, such as this haze of deep blue iris and cat mint in late spring. Thank you, and now I'd be happy to answer questions. Thank you, Ben. Um, this is Allison with the garden. I'm just going to help moderate the Q&A. And we did have some questions come in. Um, one of those was about vines growing on the houses. Um, do you think that's okay? And are there some vines that are okay to be on the houses and others that we should avoid? Well, um, I think it depends. A Boston ivy is uh, rather uh common, I would say, well, uh, in uh, terms of uh, growing on uh, houses on the North Shore. And uh, it does not do uh, a, a great deal of damage to the mortar, uh, in contrast to some other ivies, which I think uh, can be a little more uh, vigorous. But I would say in general, it is not a problem, at least in, in, in to the best of my knowledge. Great, thank you. And then also, it looks like prairies were featured in several of the gardens, um, which our attendee did not expect. I mean, is this just a coincidence or is this a common theme? Well, as, as we all know, um, where Chicago was and uh, certainly portions of uh, Missouri as well, um, the all of the land in the center part of the of of the U.S. Uh, was uh, prairies, and so uh, there's been a uh, focus, particularly I'd say over the last uh, twenty to thirty years, of both uh, the Chicago Botanic Garden has a very large prairie, uh, the Dixon Prairie, as well as homeowners who have extensive. Uh, land uh, to develop prairies. And as uh, Frank Mariani has done and <clears throat> Bill Curtis, uh, they have uh, really taken the uh, land back to its original state. They've removed invasives from the prairies and ensured that everything that has been uh, planted uh, initially uh, was native and and then of course uh, afterwards it's just ensuring that uh, uh, invasives don't continue and uh, the prairies have to be burned uh, periodically but uh, you will find uh, uh, pr uh, large prairies as I said uh, in gardens that uh, have a lot of property but in addition, you'll even find in uh, smaller ones, like for example, John Green's garden, he has a very little small portion. I didn't, it's in the book, but it, I didn't show the picture today. <clears throat> Excuse me. Of a, a little prairie area uh, where he uh, has planted prairie plants and likes to show, you know, the height of them and, and uh, the uniqueness. So I think it's become uh, important. And of course, uh, Pete Udolph has kind of uh, taken that, you know, and run with it as well in Europe and, and other places. So it's, to some degree, it's become a little fashionable, but it also is, is very uh, germane to the Midwest. 
Great. Thank you. Now, also, we've gotten a few questions about boxwoods. Um, a lot of those gardens featured boxwoods. Is there um, a certain type that's in most of those? Or do you know what the varieties are that are featured in those gardens? Well, there, there are a, a quite, a, quite a few uh, different ones. Um, the uh, uh, Korean boxwood does particularly well in, in Chicago and, pro and probably does very well also in St. Louis in that it stands up uh, well to the cold. Uh, and uh, it also, uh, certain cultivars have a fairly small leaf. So for the um, not gardens, uh, you'll see that used. Uh, the uh, Chicago Botanic Garden developed some years ago and a, a cultivar, uh, it's called uh, the Chicago Green, uh, that is very good. And uh, these are all uh, also, uh, a lot of these are Japanese derivations. Uh, unfortunately, American boxwood and English boxwood do not do well at all in the uh, Chicago area and, uh, because of the cold. Uh, so, you know, it's a wide variety, but boxwood is, is widely used as a uh, uh, staple in gardens. And we've been relatively fortunate that we have not had uh, the blight that has come, you know, that, that in England and, and other places. We, we do have uh, uh, the boxwood uh, moth, uh, but th those fortunately are, uh, you're able to deal with that with appropriate spraying at the right time. Um, but the blight we've been able, uh, with few exceptions, I'd say, uh, to avoid. Right. We definitely have a question about the boxwood blight. So thanks for including that as well. Um, these gardens, a lot of them mean are pretty intricate. Do you know, do the garden <coughs> owners employ full-time gardeners or are they doing the majority of this work themselves? Well, it depends. I would say that almost all of them <coughs> have additional help. Uh, but e even if you're digging in the dirt uh, yourself uh, and it goes from, that it climbs all the way to the one with the most is Camp Rosemary in Lake Forest. It's an amazing garden. Uh, one of the most beautiful gardens in America. And they have between 10 to 12 uh, gardeners in the season and it drops to a lower number, of course, at this time of the year, but they still have a, 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 a large staff by my standards uh, year round. So it really goes from, uh, you know, having, you know, it might be weekly help or it might be several days a week to having large staffs of gardeners. Right. So you shared your garden. Do you also have one in Charleston? Yes, I do. And it's very different. It's, um, I call it my prissy garden. Uh, the reason for that is, uh, for those of you who know Charleston, it's, it's a city with wonderful gardens. It's well known for its gardens. Uh, but they're relatively small. Uh, and some of them are just postage size to larger gardens. But, uh, and because of that, uh, they tend to be f formal. Uh, and so I have a lot of boxwood. I have a, uh, several garden rooms, and one of them is a fairly intricate um, parterre garden with lots of clipping. Uh, and, um, but it's wonderful because I have the, uh, the good fortune to be able when uh, – we leave Charleston in the uh, 
1st of May to get back to Winnetka because by that time things are beginning to emerge. Uh, so I get two springs. Um, but uh, it's a different different style and a totally different uh, plant palette. Right. Are, do you have any favorite plants that attract birds and bees? Yes. Well, I'll, I'll tell you my <clears throat> some of my favorite plants and some attract uh, pollinators uh, more than others. Uh, I love Verbena bonarensis, and that attracts uh, bees and, uh, you know, and all kinds of pollinators. It's a wonderful plant. It self-seeds, so once you get it going, you never have to buy any more. Uh, it's a wonderful see-through plant uh, because you can see the, the other parts of the garden, but these beautiful uh, lavender spikes uh, come up in uh, you know, the middle of the summer all the way to the fall. Um, also, uh, Verona castrum is a wonderful uh, another plant that pollinators uh, you know, love. The other plant that I love, I mentioned, but it doesn't attract uh, is uh, in the ravine, is uh, Pedicitis japonicus or butterbur. It's a dramatic plant. You need a lot of space for it. It can be invasive, so you have to be on top of it. But it's a architectural. It's it's a drama plant, you know. And do you have any suggestions of good perennials or annuals for a small cutting garden that might only have partial sun? Um, well, I have that problem myself with partials. I mean, you know, uh, with not, it, it, not having full sun except for a few hours in the day. So I, I kind of push the boundary to get uh, plants that can kind of take some uh, a, a fair amount of shade. I would say in the annual department, Cleome uh, does fairly well. Uh, flocks, you can try, and I've had some luck with that. Um, um, gooseneck, uh, also, Shasta daisies, Becky in particular. I think that's definitely a good start. Um, we put you on the spot there, so you <laughs> gave us some good options. We've also gotten some questions about current plant trends that you might be hesitant, hesitant to embrace, like Bradford pears. Um, any other trends that you might be a little hesitant towards? Well, as I mentioned, uh, and I, I like them, but I think one has to be a, a little bit careful. You know, uh, the trend uh, today is uh, grasses, you know, all over the place. Um, and uh, they have a place in a garden. So uh, it's making sure that you put them in the right place and in the right, with the right conditions. I think uh, what's happening to gardening because of the, as was mentioned earlier, a lot of the gardens that you saw are, are do require a, a fair amount to a lot of maintenance. And people today don't have the time nor the uh, resources to necessarily uh, do that. And so they have, the designs have gone from uh, formal uh, as, as, as some of the gardens uh, in the book 
they were designed in the thirties and the forties. And that was when people could afford to do this. And they were more, there was a more, the formal approach was, was much more able to be maintained. Nowadays, there's more of a looseness to the gardens, uh, a little more flopsy mopsy, you know, there's, you don't see the errors of the gardener uh, uh, as, as easily with that. And I think uh, we can expect that to continue. I think you have to make sure that you, it, it doesn't turn into a mess is, is what I would call it. Um, but I, I think that th those can be lovely gardens. Uh, but that's a trend that I think is going on. Right. And it looks like we have um, a handful of our attendees who really enjoyed this presentation and your book and are wondering if you have plans for another book already. <laughs> well, I think th the quick answer is no. My wife would divorce me. Um, you know, um, but I, 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 I've told her, and I do this more to just bugger, but, uh, you know, a book about Charleston Gardens, there are lots of books uh, about Charleston Gardens that various people have written, and uh, my garden is in several of them, but uh, they're slightly different. They, they, they're kind of of the whole area, and they also a lot of times will be con combined with architecture. Uh, but if I ever were to do one, I guess it would be on Charleston, but there are no plans for that at the moment. All right, well, we'll keep an eye out for it if you change your <laughs> mind. Um, and we just have time for one more question before we wrap up. Um, a lot of people are wondering if we can visit any of these gardens in person, um, if there's any tours or anything along those lines. Uh, the answer is yes. Um, uh, the Garden Conservancy, as, as you know, and many of the people on the call, uh, we have open days where we open up uh, or we get garden owners to open up their gardens. And so um, one of the things that I'm hopeful of doing with these gardens that are on the, you know, I, many of the people in the, in the book are friends. Uh, there were some people who I had had not uh, known uh, and was introduced to them through landscape architects. But I am hopeful that uh, perhaps this coming year, uh, depending upon COVID, that we may be able to get uh, some of the owners to open up their gardens to a limited, it, it, it may not be uh, to hundreds of people, but to a limited uh, numbers of people. And, uh, and maybe do that over several years so that one could see a lot of the gardens, uh, you know, it, over two or three years. But uh, yes, there are opportunities and, and the gardens, some of the gardens that you have seen in the book have been, uh, you could have visited them through open days in the past. Right. Well, thank you again, Ben, and thank you everyone who has joined for today's member speaker series um, and getting to take a closer look at these unique gardens. Um, hopefully one day we might be able to see one or two of them in person. And just as a reminder, um, the code for 30% off of Ben's book was included in your email with the link for today's meeting. So if you are interested, please make sure to use that link and get yourself a copy. Um, but thanks so much, and we hope to see you at our next speaker series. Thank you very much, Allison. Yeah, thank, thank you, Ben, and thanks, everybody, for joining us. We'll see you next month. Bye-bye.